Well, hello, my name is Ani Jayant, and I'm here going to be presenting with my friend Mike Saunders about the trends in supermarket refrigeration architectures. I think this is one of those topics that we should be mindful about going forward because there's a lot of things that are happening in our refrigeration food retail industry that is going to influence a lot of these architecture changes. The story really begins with this chart that you see in behind me. There are some forcing mechanisms that are happening related to refrigerants that is uh, taking place not only here in the United States but also globally. And so this F gas phase down that you're seeing from that was not only an extension of the Montreal Protocol but has now been an actual formal process from October, 20, uh, October 15, 2016 where we ratified with a, a bunch of other countries that in fact we need to phase down ozone depleting refrigerants and with lower global warming potential. So this is going to mean something for architectures that we have employed in the food retail space today. Not only that, but there's also a patchwork of different regulations that is impacting the choice refrigerants as well. And as you can see, you have the F gas phase down with the European Union, and now you also have two other applications with the uh, California Air Resources Board, as well as uh, the Canadian proposal in reducing global warming potential refrigerants. As you can see behind me, all refrigerant sales for CARB, um, it needs to be under 2,500. That's happening in 2020. And all commercial refrigeration has to be at 150 GWP. These are extremely difficult challenges that have to be met, and right now it's currently under proposal, and we are expecting to see if this will become an actual rule. Uh, same goes for Canada. In the United States, what you see behind me here is dashed in, in yellow are the supermarket new architectures of today. As of January 1st, 2017, a prevalent refrigerant R404A is no longer going to be allowed to be used for new constructions for architectures and rack systems. What is interesting on this same page is the fact that 407A is in fact not delisted by the EPA. So therefore, we feel confident as an industry going forward to continue employing 407A architectures. But as you can see from the F-gas phase down, 407A has in fact a high global warming potential. So therefore, it's going to be a matter of time before the United States gets affected. We're uncertain at the moment of when that's going to be. What is also interesting to note on this chart is that there are alternative refrigerants that have in fact been approved in place for 404A uh, besides 407A. And that's 448A, 449A, respectively a Honeywell gas and a formerly DuPont, Camor's gas. And same goes for 450A and 513A. Honeywell, Camores, and more of a 134A-like refrigerant. So those two refrigerants are, in fact, usable. And some of these architectures use, like a Cascade architecture, would use a 134A-like refrigerant, like 450A or 513A. And more, mainly the main uh, refrigerant uh, used today with 404A going to 407A. 448A is an option to consider for the future. So as you can see, this graph here be, shown be, behind me is showing the, on the x-axis the GWP of all these refrigerants, and then on the y-axis, incumbent refrigerants of today uh, organized categorically by the pressures. So CO2 on the y-axis is at a high pressure refrigerant, medium back pressure refrigerant, 404A, and finally your low back pressure, back pressure refrigerant, 134A. The green boxes that you see here are indicating that they are A1 refrigerants, meaning they are non-flammable. The pink boxes are mildly flammable. The red box, obviously, is highly flammable. The orange box, ammonia, is a toxicity level that is slightly flammable as well as toxic. So the natural play for the F-gas regulations that you see on top and then the U.S. Um, EPA SNAP delisting, you can see that we are moving more towards the left in that GWP scale. So currently with 407A being the refrigerant today in architectures, we should be able to hold on to that, but for a, a considerable amount of time, we need to be thinking of other alternative refrigerants. 
The challenges facing the, the pink and red boxes are the fact that there's flammability, uh, refrigerants involved that have some kind of charge limits, as well as commercial kitchen codes, commercial building codes implications. So once that gets sorted out, it remains to be seen where this industry is going to head. I just spent some time discussing that we, there, are, there is forcing mechanisms out here that is making us rethink how architectures need to look like in the future. Currently today, you see two prevalent architectures that are being employed in our food retail uh, space. One is our centralized refrigeration rack architecture and a distributed rack architecture. Both, both architectures, in fact, use HFCs. Now, there is multiple permutations and different variations of these architectures, and one of which is a uh, cascade architecture that you see here behind me that, in fact, has the ability to eliminate HFC on your medium temp uh, allowing you to use CO2 on the low temp. And in doing that, you're basically adding heat exchangers, uh, you're reducing your refrigerant charge, and you have a way now to work with an architecture that in fact eliminates a little bit of HFC. Similarly, you can go from a cascade to what's called a secondary system. And here again, you have a glycol loop, you have the ability to eliminate HFC from one aspect of it, uh, of the actual architecture itself and you have the ability to exchange heat through the help of a glycol heat exchanger and, pump, and pumps. And then finally, you have the transcritical booster architecture, which is a full CO2 architecture that employs no HFCs, and this is one way to basically reduce your carbon footprint and employ something that you could quote unquote call green. There is also another way you can do this, and that is with this micro-distributed architecture, and now you have the ability to use propane. As you could probably remember, that propane has charge limits, 150 grams. So at the case level, you could have 150 gram circuits all along the while, and, the, and your method of heat exchange will in fact be a glycol loop that will be uh, rejecting that. So the first uh, box, the first two boxes you saw are prevalent architectures of today. The middle are partial HFC and natural refrigerants. And of course, these architectures are vast and many. There's ways you can slice and dice these. And in fact, you can also even use HFCs on the cascades and secondaries. But I'm showing this as an example. And finally, the last two are all natural refrigerants uh, that you could consider. So the question becomes, out of those six architectures that I talked about, what does the market look like in the United States of America with our current installed base. Well, we have roughly about 40 plus thousand supermarkets. 95% of the architectures in supermarkets today are either centralized HFC or distributed HFC, with the remainder 5% allocated between those other four architectures I discussed. It's interesting to note that that's less than 5%, and with trends happening in Europe, when you go and see all natural refrigerants, that seems to be a big push in that region, we asked the question, well, what does this look like in the European Union? It looks like this. It is not an overwhelming amount of CO2 transcritical booster systems or, or propane. It is actually 15% full booster systems, but still the prevalent overwhelming number of architectures in Europe is in fact 75% within centralized and distributed. There are decision influencers that, that make this change. For example, if you think about first cost and applied cost, total cost of ownership, the refrigerant cost, um, and the service cost of it, these are all things that drive some kind of a decision to say whether or not these architectures need to change, along with that big forcing mechanism that I began my presentation with regarding the EPA and F-gas regulations on refrigerants. But ultimately, it comes down to what this forum is about. It's E360. It's about energy, economics, environment, equipment. So you have F-gas on the regulatory compliance. That's, you have local codes and charge limits. Then you have your investment that you need to be thinking about because a lot of these new architectures are, in fact, going to employ electronic case controls and electronic valves. And you're also, you're going to get some energy saving. These are all not going to be done in vain just to hit energy, man or ju not just to hit EPA and cl global climate. Uh, mandates, but it is also going to put some money back into your pocket as a facilitator or an end user um, operator.
And there's also, of course, the return on investment of what it takes to put all these equipment into play. So the big question of the day is, what is this architecture from USA 2017 going to look like in 2025? These are exaggerated numbers, mind you, that I have a hard time wondering about what it's going to look like with all these forcing mechanisms in the future. And it's something to consider going forward. So now we'll move to Mike Saunders, who's going to talk in more detail about these five prevalent architectures that, that I discussed today. He's going to talk about all the different trade-offs and the value propositions for each of those architectures and what you should be considering when making a decision going forward if, in fact, an architecture change needs to happen. With that, I will turn it over to Mike Saunders. Thank you. Thanks, Ani. Um, the next part of this discussion, I'm going to go into a little bit of detail of five of the architectures that he kind of introduced. I'm going to talk about a centralized, distributed, secondary cascade, as well as a CO2 booster. And I'm going to look at different attributes uh, with each one. I'm going to be looking at the, the refrigerant options, the low GWP options that are available, uh, some of the leak challenges with each one's complexity, initial cost, as well as maintenance costs and efficiency. And as you can see on the chart, I've kind of given it a grading scale. Uh, five stars in green, uh, probably the best, uh, maybe one star red, not so good. Again, this is kind of very subjective, but it gives you kind of food for thought as we, as we kind of go through this, dis dis this discussion. So you've seen this chart or versions of it uh, in, the in the past where, with the different refrigerants. Um, and the trend is all, all architectures want to move left. You want to you go to the lowest GWP option that is available. Um, today, most of the uh, very large uh, uh, centralized and distributed systems use 404A. 407A is, is the option of choice uh, in most new construction today, although 448, 449 are becoming very uh, prevalent. Unfortunately, in order to get to the lowest GWP options that Audi talked about, some of the A2Ls on the left here, um, the refrigerant charges go down, especially in propane, 150 grams. And these large systems just cannot, uh, they cannot handle that. So you have, to, you have to change system architectures. You maybe go to a secondary that can have a, a smaller refrigerant charge. Um, so in the, in the large systems, uh, centralized and distributed, for example, you're kind of limited on how low you can go in your GWP. In fact, on this next chart, I tried to kind of visualize uh, what that means uh, for all those coffee drinkers out there. Centralized systems typically use about uh, 2,000 pounds or more of refrigerant. And that equates to about 32,000 cups of coffee, which is a significant amount. Uh, all the way down on the self-contained side, you're looking at about two-thirds cup of coffee, uh, about 150 grams. And, and the, the systems in the middle, they, they kind of handle, uh, they're somewhere in the middle. And as you move to the smaller charges, of course, you go from the A1 non-flammable to the mildly flammable A2Ls, all the way down to the A3s, the, the flammable uh, systems as well. And you can see on the left my kind of grading scale as far as the, 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 which ones are more conducive. You know, the CO, CO2 booster system, I've given it the highest level um, of, of green stars, only because uh, it, it's a GWP of one. Even though it's a very large charge, it has a very low GWP footprint. So the next category I want to discuss briefly is the leaks uh, in supermarkets. And Greenshell provides a lot of good detail about this. Um, and so what I'm showing here is some data that they've presented previously about the sources of, of leaks in refrigeration systems. Uh, and if you look at compressors, display cases, and the uh, remote air-cooled condensers, that's about two-thirds of the leaks in a system. Those are the major components uh, where leaks can, can, can occur. Um, the rest, you know, can be made up in the, in, in the, in the, in the field installed piping, uh, you know, the walk-in evaporators, AC units, condenser units, and such. The larger the system, the more potential you have for leak. There are more joints, there's more components, uh, and so the system uh, you know, is more probable to leak, unfortunately. Uh, and any system that does leak uh, over time is going to be susceptible uh, to performance issues. You know, initially, when, if they've got a small leak, for example, on this chart here, uh, I'm showing the total refrigerant charge on the y-axis and the kind of time on the x-axis. Uh, initially, a small leak is probably mostly an environmental impact. You're not going to see you know, performance impacting. You're not going to see temperature degradation in, in your cases or anything like that. You're going to be leaking refrigerant in small quantities, and it's going to be an environmental impact. Leak detection equipment is good about uh, capturing and, and, and notifying, alerting people of those type of, types of scenarios. But as time goes on and, and you have more leaks or they become larger, 
Um, then you start, mind, you might see the uh, liquid level alarm uh, issues. And now you start to see a performance impact uh, on your equipment. Your discharge temperatures on your compressors might go up. Uh, your superheats may not be controllable. So you start to see an energy impact on your equipment. And ultimately, if you keep um, leaking uh, more, uh, you're going to see a system's capacity impact. And at that point, this become a, a food safety, a food quality issue. You're going to see temperature alarms on the cases. Um, and, and, that, and nobody wants to see that. Uh, I've listed, listed on the right a lot of the issues. Uh, you know, why do the leaks occur? Uh, a lot of it's maintenance related, uh, some of it's design related, size of the equipment and such. So this next category is, I want to talk about is the complexity, the initial cost, and the maintenance. Um, I've kind of grouped the, the, the five systems that I'm talking about into two categories. And up in the upper right corner you can see the centralized and distributed, but kind of put a box around it. And you notice there's a lot of green stars in those boxes. If you look at the, the bottom three categories, uh, the three systems, there, there's a lot of oranges and reds in there. Uh, and that really ties to the complexity uh, of the system, in my mind. Centralized and distributed uh, systems are well known. They're well established. They've been in industry for many, many years. Uh, there's a very good uh, supply chain, well established. Uh, replacement parts are available. Technicians know how to deal with them. Um, they're, they're well understood. Some of the newer technologies, what I'm calling the newer, the secondary, the cascade, and the boosters, uh, they're not nearly um, as well understood in the industry. Uh, initial costs tend to be a little bit higher because they're newer to the industry. Technicians uh, may not understand them. They may need specialized training, especially if you get into some of the CO2 controls, for example. Um, and it, we all understand that, that our industry is, is, is challenged with a shortage of, of, of of, of technicians, and, and so that's certainly not, uh, that's something to be considered, I guess, when, when you're looking at the different architectures. And lastly, the complexity as far as the controls go, all of these uh, new systems, uh, they do require a little bit more advanced controls. Case controls, for example, are required uh, on CO2 systems. That's an extra level of complexity. Um, so on top of the mechanical, you've got electronic uh, and, and electronic controls uh, that have to be dealt with as well. So this next section I want to get into is a little bit about the efficiency uh, of the equipment. And to do that, I've done an analysis here uh, looking at two different climate zones, a cool climate up in the uh, Minneapolis area and, and, a, and a zone two as far as the ASHRAE climate zones go uh, in Phoenix, uh, a hot climate zone. I'm going to look at uh, the five different systems um, and I'm going to look at the LCCP, the life cycle climate performance. Um, for these systems using various refrigerants. Uh, I'm going to be looking at 404A for the baseline, so that'll be what I'll be comparing everything to. I'll be looking at 407A, uh, 448A, and then on a secondary, I'm also going to throw in an A2L refrigerant as well for a comparison. And then we'll look at some of the low-pressure uh, refrigerant options in Cascades systems as well as the booster. So we'll jump right into the data. Uh, this first chart is, I've got two charts on this, uh, two graphs on this chart. Uh, the left one shows annual CO2 emissions, and on the right I'm showing peak power consumption. Uh, the x-axis on the left chart looks at total CO2 per year that is uh, emitted, I guess, and there's two components to that. There's a direct and an indirect component. So the left two bars, the green and the blue bar, are the indirect, which is the CO2 equivalent due to the power generation used to, by the equipment as it's consuming electricity. Uh, and the two bars to the right, uh, the purple and orange, uh, are the direct. So those, those are directly related to the GWP of the refrigerant and how much is leaked per year. I've also put a couple other numbers on the left chart. There's a, a red number at the, the right of each bar that's in uh, a red number and then a blue number. The red number corresponds to the power uh, compared to the baseline, which would be your centralized 404A system. And then the CO2 is also a comparison. So that's the total CO2. CO2. Up the left, we're looking at centralized, distributed, secondary, cascade, and booster with the various refrigerants. And if we jump over to the right real quick, um, that is the peak power consumption for these same systems, looking at the two bars, the low temp and the medium temp uh, portions of, the, of, their, of that equipment. So just a few things I want to point out uh, as we kind of, I like to go from the bottom up. So the baseline 404A centralized uh, is where we're at. If we go to 407A, so all we do is change refrigerant. 
um, we see about a 26% reduction in CO2. Uh, that's just due to the lower GWP of, of the refrigerant. If you go to 448A, which is a newer refrigerant, has a slightly lower GWP, you can get about a 39% reduction in CO2. The red number corresponding there, you can see an equivalent uh, reduction in, in power as well. They're slightly more efficient refrigerants than 44A, uh, and overall in a system, you do see a, a, a slight increase. Jumping up to the distributed, the 407A uh, and 448, very, very comparable as far as energy numbers compared to the baseline as well as CO2. Secondaries, on the other hand, kind of up to the next level, uh, they do consume a little bit more energy than, than the baseline. And that's due to the fact that you've got uh, an extra heat exchanger uh, and you've also got a pump, a glycol, glycol pump that you have to, to deal with. Uh, although the CO2 reduction is, is very healthy, it's very good. Cascade systems, further up the top here, um, I'm looking at 134A and 513. Uh, get a little bit of reduction in, in, in power as well, and, and also uh, CO2. And finally, the CO2 booster at the top. Uh, this Minneapolis is a cool climate. You get about a 15% reduction in energy, which is actually pretty darn good. And of course, 63%, almost 63% in CO2. It's very nice. One last thing I want to point out here on the secondary. If you'll notice, I've got a 407A, a 448, and a 448B. I've got an A2L fluid, and a 448B is an A2L. Because the codes are not well understood yet, they're not defined, the building codes and such, we don't know what the charge limits are going to be. I made the assumption that I'd be able to use them in a secondary, so I did the analysis here. I did not show it in the centralized and distributed because those charge limits are quite large, and, and, and I got a feeling that we may not be able to use A2Ls in that type of equipment. If we jump over to the right, just want to point out a couple things on the peak power. Um, Minneapolis is a cool cli climate. Uh, in most cases, you see a nice reduction uh, in, in peak power compared to the, uh, to the baseline, except in CO2. Uh, you see a very large increase in peak power. That's because uh, Minneapolis, even though annually it's a cool climate, they do have a few hot days out of the year. Uh, and because of that, you get a very large peak in, in energy demand on those hottest days. And that's something to consider, um, especially when you're doing your selection uh, if, you, if you're building in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area that, that has peak demand charges associated with the electrical rates, uh, that could be a challenge to deal with. Now, there are technologies that help mitigate some of that uh, peak demand, uh, and we can talk about that later, but uh, something to at least keep in mind. So this is a cool climate. The next chart here is in a hot climate. So I'm looking at Phoenix, uh, which is very, very warm. Uh, the trends look very, very similar. You see a reduction on the distributed. Uh, Secondary is a little bit higher power. Uh, nice reduction in, in CO2, of course. Um, you go up to the booster at the top. Um, CO2, even in a, in a warm climate, <laughs> you know, it's about 10% more, uh, more energy. It's not good on an annual basis. Uh, but if you jump over to the peak power, uh, it, that, that's about 46% or so more energy on those hottest days, about 115 or whatever degrees it is in Phoenix. It's hot. Now, there's technologies that help mitigate that. Like I mentioned, you could do adiabatic uh, condensing. Um, you can do uh, parallel compression. You've got ejectors. You've got mechanical subcooling. There's a lot of technologies that are new uh, that are be adding, being added to that, those types of systems. Uh, but again, each one adds complexity, and that's something also to be considered. So the last thing I want to talk about here is the annual energy and the peak energy uh, that I've been discussing in those two climates. What I've done here is I've taken um, all the weather data that I had uh, for all the U.S. cities located uh, throughout the U.S., and I'm looking at a centralized system with 404A here. And what I did is I calculated the uh, annual energy consumption on the left and also the peak energy consumption or peak power consumption on the right. And I've just plotted them. So on the left one here, the blue colors are at the lowest uh, amount of, of, of uh, energy consumption, and of course you go down to the reds and, and browns and that would be in the high end, and that makes sense. Cool climates in the north, less energy being consumed than the warm climates in the south. Look at the right chart over there, and um, it tells a little bit different story on the peak. Uh, even though it's cool in the northern climates, especially in the central portions of the U.S., it can get very, very warm, and you see a lot of reds. Uh, it gets hot. 
In fact, put a couple stars on here. If you look at the, the northwest region, the yellow star up there uh, in the Seattle area, very, very nice, cool climate annually. And if you look at the peak power consumption, it actually looks pretty good. It's green, so it's one of the lowest. However, if you look in the nor northern panhandle of Texas, it's green. It's kind of in the middle as far as energy consumption relative to the other locations. But if you jump over to the right, the peak energy, uh, you know, it's bright red. Um, and so it, it does get very, very warm, and that's something to be considered uh, when you're looking at these different architectures, uh, more specifically the CO2. Now, we've heard talk about that CO2 equators moving further and further south, uh, and that is true, and that's brought on by all those uh, uh, technology enhancements uh, that I talked about early, earlier on the CO2 systems. So the last thing I want to just leave you with here is the, the same chart that Ani talked to earlier. You know, we've tried to present some food for thought here when you're evaluating the different systems uh, and what might be best for your application. There's no right, you know, right or wrong architecture for what you're trying to do. It's, you know, what meets the needs that you're trying to establish. Um, but, you know, just food for thought, if you look out to the year 2025, you know, we've thrown out some numbers of what we think it might be. They're, they're probably not real. You know, what would they be in your mind? And with that, I thank you for your time.